Hey friends, happy Wednesday. I'm coming in from Austin, Texas. Where are you coming in from? If you're joining us live, tell us over in the chat. If you're joining us while you're walking your dog in the park or washing dishes or going for a run, just sending a big hello on your favorite podcast network to you as well. As you know, we meet here live, which is part of the magic, but we also know that life gets in the way, meetings get in the way, emails get in the way, da, 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 which is the perfect intro to today's session, which I'm really excited to talk about, but also just excited to see Jim and Jeff and Anya and Los Angeles, Phoenix, Raleigh. We've got so many people coming in. Oh, it is so good to be here with you all. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on today. So it means the world that you're spending your Wednesday here with all of us. If you're new here, welcome to the group. We meet here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern to copy each other's homework and copy the homework of really smart, interesting executive CEOs and business leaders so that we can make our lives much, much easier, which I am all about. You might be thinking that you can sit back and relax and take a big cup of your favorite caffeine and relax, which you can do, or you can lean in, dive into your keyboard and meet us over in the chat where lots of tips and tricks and tactics are being shared. So if you have some, don't keep it to yourself. That's rude. And we don't like that. You have to share with the rest of the class so that we can all learn a little something from you too. I'm stoked for us to learn today from somebody who I have been following on LinkedIn for quite some time and have watched many of her LinkedIn learning courses. And that is Daisy Lovelace. And you are going to fall in love with her as I have fallen in love with her. I have no doubt. But in particular, one of her LinkedIn learning courses that really just kind of got me, got me right in the heart. Um, when I watched it, when it came out late last year, was all about writing emails. And if you know me, you know that I have so many gripes about emails. <laughs> that is like my soapbox that I will just stand on to no end. My biggest gripe, which if you saw the post promoting this LinkedIn Live, you saw was that people who don't have telephone numbers in the, the in their email signature literally make me want to pull my hands through a computer and shake them ever so severely because how can I get in touch with you? I don't like that. I know that we're all big into like tech and we're, we're using our chat GPT-4 to write our emails and send our text messages. No, I like to flash back to the good old 80s and 90s and I want to be able to pick up the phone and I want to be able to talk to you like, like a real person. Um, and so nothing drives me more crazy than A, people that don't have telephone numbers in their signature or B, my other personal favorite that I definitely get on my soapbox about is when I email you and we're emailing each other like three, four or five times. And I think to myself, this is so dumb. This is getting lost in translation. Let me pick up the phone and call this other human. And they don't answer. And they let it go to voicemail. And I leave a voicemail explaining my like half of this back and forth email. And then literally three minutes later, they send me an email. Which means you saw that I called, which means you watched my number on your phone come up. And then because you're so scared of the phone, you're like, and then you're just going to email me back. Anyway, um, enough about me and my personal gripes about email etiquette, because really, we're going to we're going to get into best practices today with none other. I hope you'll oh, wherever you are, raise your mug, your glass, your cup, your wine cup and help me welcome Daisy to join us for a little caffeine. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that introduction. I'm going to join you right on the soapbox because there are lots of things that I hate. I also, there are things I love about email when it's done well, but lots of things I also hate. So I'm right there with you. I mean, literally you have, I feel like written the book on this in terms of, you know, hopefully I always tell people to Google stalk you before you come on, but Daisy literally has like 14 courses on and learning that are all about success and writing emails and managing teams. And so you you literally have like been knees deep in this subject for quite some time. 
Yes, I, and I spend a lot of time working with uh, executives and also students who are looking to put their best foot forward. And so my focus areas are communication and leadership. And a big part of how you lead, a huge part of how we communicate is through email. And we all know how to use email. And we don't think about strategy around email. And that is a really missed opportunity. So I'm excited that you wanted to have this conversation today, Kim. Okay. So just because I feel like I was just on my soapbox, I'm curious for your soapbox, what are like one or two email faux pas? Or when you see them, you're just like, ah, cringe. Okay. So you said one or two. I have a lot. So I'm going to go with two. <laughs> my first one is a vague subject line. If I see a vague yes. subject line, unless it is coming from somebody I absolutely know I need to respond to right away or somebody I'm really excited to be hearing from, I just go to the next email. Because realistically, an email, your inbox is a to-do list that you have very little control over. Well, even if you are responding and trying to keep your inbox cluttered down, messages are coming, you wake up to messages. When you go into a meeting, you think you're on top of your day and you come back and you have so many email messages. And so for me, when I'm stepping out of a class or, or having a moment to check my email, if I can tell from the subject line what I need to know, then I am excited to either move on from the message or respond quickly. If the message is, if the subject line is vague, if it's something like the word update or meeting, then I need to open it and read the details and figure out what's going on. But if the update is that we're changing the meeting or the meeting's been canceled, the meeting's been rescheduled or moved to another location, if you can put that in the subject line, if the subject line makes standalone sense, so that's S-A-S, -S, standalone sense, I call that a sassy subject line. And when it's sassy, then it catches my attention and I am appreciative that the person took the moment to think about me, think about what I needed to know instead of what was easiest for them. And so that my biggest pet peeve, I turned it around into how to fix it uh, and answering that question is around subject lines. I, I love this. And I feel like you really hooked a lot of us when you said that there is strategy when it comes to email. Because I think a lot of people probably think more like me where email is just another form of communication, you know, very similar to a phone or a text message, which maybe doesn't have a lot of strategy, or at least my text messages certainly don't have a lot of strategy. So let's, let's pull on that cord a little bit. So talk to us a little bit more about strategy when it comes to emails. Yeah, there's absolutely a whole way to think about a, the, the strategy for how you communicate via email. Your subject line, I, that was my first pet peeve. Another one of mine is when messages are really long and not well organized, and I'm not sure what the point is or what I need to do is. And so another thing you can do strategically, if you're thinking, when you send an email to someone, it's likely because you want them to do something. If you make it easier for them to do it, the likelihood that they actually follow through goes up significantly, right? But if you make it hard for me, especially if you're emailing me, asking me to do something, and you make it hard for me to engage or participate, then it's just much more likely that you're going to get a response you don't want. You're making it easier for me to say no to you instead of yes. So the first strategy is to think about your audience. What do they need? What is their day most likely like? And how can you make their life easier? How can you increase the likelihood they'll say yes to whatever it is you're asking for or looking for in the message? I got an email. Actually, it, it turns out that first message came two weeks ago and I missed it. And the subject line was faculty panel. And that could mean any number of things. And I had so many other things going on. And so I missed, I, ju I just missed the message. When I opened it, there was a very long block of text. And so I don't know, the eyes don't know where to go. And it's very easy to be overwhelmed. We have to remember people are not only reading their emails on computers. So if you're writing your email on a computer and you have a lot of text, it might seem reasonable there. But if I'm looking at it on my watch or on my phone or some other smaller device, and I see this long block of text, 
my eyes glaze over and I just move on to the next thing. And I hate to say that because it sounds really rude, but if we're all being honest on this call, just between us friends, we all do this, right? You see an email and it looks like a book. We just move on because we don't have the time unless it's coming from someone who we absolutely know we need to respond to. We miss it. And so this person very politely two weeks later sent another email following up. And I was embarrassed that I missed the email. I remember exactly what was happening. My child was sick. I was taking her to urgent care. We had all these things going on and I missed it. And so I did follow up. But when I finally read through the original email buried after the fourth paragraph was the request. So this panel was asking me to participate in as a panelist. And that was at the very bottom of the message. And so if you have a long message, you can summarize it with a bluff statement. Bluff being bottom line up front. This is something that you see people in the military use a lot. So give me a sassy headline, make it make standalone sense. And then give me a bluff statement, even if it's in the, the after your greeting. You can have a quick hello if you feel better about warming up in your email. And then give me a bluff. Tell me what the bottom line of your message is. If it needs to be five paragraphs, fine. But give me the bottom line first. And then I know if the answer is maybe I keep reading. If the answer is no, I can respond right away. If the answer is yes, I can respond right away. I don't need to go through the details because I know the bottom line. I feel like that's so great. It's something that I do a lot for meetings or conferences or in-person events. I'll, like the, my email will just say, hey, are you free? I'm making this up. Are you free April 19th? Have something going on. If you're in town, I'll send you more details. Because immediately if that person's not in town, they don't need the three paragraph description of how awesome the event or gathering is going to be. They're not in town. They're not in town. So I love this idea of just kind of up front putting like what's the bottom line of this email but kind of back to your point about having really long emails or blocks of paragraphs that people aren't reading what about this idea that some people do in the subject line where it turns into like a run-on sentences uh, run-on sentence or like two or three sentences i definitely have had clients who shall remain nameless who definitely do this like it will say in the subject line are you free next Tuesday for a meeting? Need to talk to you about new order. That's the subject. And then the body of the email has nothing. What's up with that? What's up with that? I mean, you only gave me two pet peeves, but if I had a third, I could add that for sure. It's it's sloppy. It's rushed. It's the easiest thing for you to do instead of hitting the tab to move your message to the body to just put everything in the subject line. But depending on the type of device you're using, it might even get cut off. So I can't even see the whole paragraph that you've put in the subject line. And now I have to move to another device to read it, which just decreased the likelihood I was going to respond even more. What about this idea that when you're doing these sort of bluffs or summaries and getting, you really want that fast response, you want somebody to get back to you, but you also know that you need to give them a little bit more information. So in my example, you might say, well, I don't know if somebody wants to commit to coming to an event that they actually don't know anything about. Um, or they might say, well, I think I'm free, but like they're not going to really commit until you give them more. What about this idea of using I don't know if it's bullet points or maybe using like a chat GPT to summarize your wordiness a little bit more. What kind of tools and tactics do you, do you use to tighten up something that might be like a two paragraph description? Bullets at the top are a great way to break up the text and also tell people where to focus. Because if I know, let's say that this is a five paragraph email and I know that there are, are I have a bulleted list of what each paragraph is about generally at the top of the message, I can tell by a quick scan. I'm interested in bullets two and five. The, For example, the, the venue location or the details before might not matter to me because I'm in town, but I want to know who the audience is and, and what the timeline is. And if I know from the ask that these are the five things you're covering in this order, I can quickly skim to those sections read what I care about, and then move on. I can respond to you. So the next tip 
I have is make your emails skim worthy. Make it easy for people who are multitasking, people who are busy with lots of things, people who are having a conversation and maybe glancing down at their phone or looking at something else while your message is coming across. Make it easy for them to skim it and get a sense of it. I try to think of a reader as somebody who is going through the airport security line. We all see them. They're going through airport security. They're looking at their phones. They put the phone down, walk through the line. Could they skim your message before and answer it in that time? If so, then you've done the homework of making your message concise and well-organized so that you're likely to get the outcome you're looking for. I love this idea of just really making it as concise as possible. And I'm glad that Liz brought up this word scrutinize because I, I definitely wanted to touch on this too, which sometimes I find myself if I'm if I'm having to send either a hard email or a very wordy email or an email that has a lot of details in it, I will spend like hours mm -hmm. like because I'll like reread it and then like I'll be like, no, that doesn't sound good and I'll erase it. And you know, I feel like there's kind of two schools of thought, which is one, yes, take your time and make sure it's perfect. And the other one is kind of like, to your point, like, like least viable product, like get it out there, like get the bullet points out there. And obviously you've worked with like hundreds of thousands of people, like when it comes to teams and communication and success, which, which way or which style have you found has been the most successful? Like, is it helpful to like, scrutinize an email for an hour and a half before you send it? Or is it just more like, listen, you gotta, you gotta get the information out there. This is probably not a very satisfying answer, Kim, but it just <laughs> depends. It depends on the content of the message and the purpose yeah. of the message, right? You use the word hard to describe emails, right? Sometimes you're writing a hard message. Is this something that could lead to a lawsuit or be brought up in litigation. A lot of times we think about emails as private correspondence, right? Mm. We used to pass each other notes in school. It's the same kind of thing. But realistically, your emails, especially if you're using a company's email, they could end up in discovery documents as a part of litigation. And so you do want to be careful about what you put in email. Would you be comfortable having your email reprinted in the New York Times or wherever you live in the world, a, a popular periodical? Would you feel confident or feel like the message that you put forward represents you and what you want? I mean, I think if we're being honest, if we go through our inboxes, there are probably lots of things that we don't want yeah. other people reading or seeing that we're putting in our inboxes. And when you are using a company's server and their, their email, it's not your private information. It belongs to the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. Definitely something that people need to keep in mind. <laughs> that is not a personal message. That <laughs> is a message that the company can dig into. Well, not only that, but it's so easy to forward it, right? If you wrote a hard email yeah. to someone and then they forward it to someone else or they blind copy other people, which is a whole nother issue we could talk about, but you, you don't have control over the life of the message in the same ways you would other things. And so if you're scrutinizing a message because it's something sensitive or because it's something that you want to be dealt with carefully, that's the right move. And if it doesn't need to be in writing, it begs the question, should you set up a call? Should you, would it be faster to have a phone conversation or a meeting because the content is something that might not translate, it might not get read the way you want it to get read, right? When we write emails, we hear our own voice as we write the message. And one thing I try to do is, especially when I'm frustrated. I will go back. I, I never send an angry email. Wait until you're not upset. Wait until you're not sad. Whatever it is you're feeling, wait until that's passed. Then write the email and then read it in an angry voice. Read it sarcastically if, you're, if it's a sensitive message because you might mean it with the most positive intent of intentions. But if the person on the receiving end thinks it's coming across in a different way because of something else, then your message is getting taken totally out of context. And so you've spent a lot of time scrutinizing or agonizing over what you're communicating and it's not landing how you want it to. 
I was just listening to a podcast actually earlier this week, and it was a podcast with uh, Seth Godin and Tim Ferriss. I don't know if anybody listens to the Tim Ferriss podcast, but it was a really great episode. And uh, they were talking about Seth Godin uh, writes a blog. He submits a new blog every single day. And he talks about how he has submitted so many blogs in the Google search engine and whatnot that chat GPT-4, if you actually write something in it, like if I were to write a paragraph in it and I say, make this paragraph uh, sound like Seth Godin, it would sound like sound like Seth Godin. And he talks about how um, he started to use it in a way that says, tell me all of the negative connotations that could be derived from this message. Because he was talking about blind spots, exactly what you said, like we write a message and we think that this looks fantastic, but then somebody else writes a message and, you know, maybe they're not perceiving it this way. So, you know, what I guess when it comes to AI, um, and there's lots of different ones, whether it's ChatGPT4 or, or anything else that people can use, what are your thoughts on people, I guess, like almost having a conversation with or like workshopping back and forth with these AIs when it comes to writing? AI can be an amazing tool if you use it as support, but you're also mm -hmm. checking it. So what I would yeah. say is there are there are great tools you can use, uh, things like Grammarly that you can build into your yeah. email that will tell you the tone of your message. And they even sometimes summarize it with an emoji. So if you mm. wrote an email, it will tell and it sounded frustrating from the tone. Grammarly will tell you this tone of this message is frustrated. And if that's not the tone you wanted to convey, then you could use ChatGPT or another AI tool to soften the tone or to redirect the tone so that even though you were frustrated in writing it, that doesn't come across in your communication. Or maybe you sound optimistic, but you don't want to sound as optimistic as you do. Or perhaps you sound like there's no hope and you want it to sound optimistic. AI can help you flag some of those things more easily than you would notice it yourself. Going back to your point about blind spots, we don't necessarily pick up on our own quirks about how we write or how we communicate. And so using it as a tool to give you that type of feedback is really helpful. The part that's tricky is AI doesn't fully understand everything. And so if you're using AI to try to summarize what you're saying, if you don't check it carefully, it can become pretty clear that you didn't write it based on the types of responses that come out, at least for where the technology is now. Oh, absolutely. For anybody, can you just speak what Grammarly is just in case anybody in our chat doesn't know what Grammarly is? Yes, it's a free tool. Uh, another one is Hemingway that uh, that does some on the spot editing for you with your writing. It tells you if you have a sentence that you could shorten or that is really complicated and hard to follow, if there's something that you've written in passive voice. And so it's hard to understand who the actors are or who or, or what action is happening by whom. It will point that out to you and tell you how to adjust your statement or at least flag it for you. It also does things like the typical grammar checks. It'll flag words that you've misspelled or maybe you've used a really complicated word that is likely going to either confuse your reader, slow them down, or just be off-putting. And so it will flag those types of things for you. And it's a these are, these are free tools. We love free. I love the price of free. Free is my favorite, my favorite price to pay. Um, I know you mentioned it briefly, but I'm just curious, are you a yay or are you a nay on emojis in corporate emails? Depends on the relationship of okay. the sender and the audience of the message. Generally speaking, though, I'm a yay on emojis for a couple of reasons. And there's research that shows that when emojis were used effectively in negotiation, they led to better outcomes for the people involved in the negotiation. And that's partially because with the subtext of your messages, things can be read very differently. And so if you put an emoji on it, it takes away the question of what was intended by the statement. And so if I put a smiley face after something, then it's clear that this is something I am happy about or I'm smiling about. Whereas if I have the same statement with a quizzical face or an angry face, then that sends a different message. And so it's 
in terms of clarifying things, I think it can be pretty helpful. It adds a personal touch to our communication and you can say more with a picture than you can with words. So true. And then maybe everybody don't start attaching actual photos to your, to your emails. Although I guess you could. Um, I'm so glad, I hope I'm saying this right, Mahal, Mahal I don't know if I'm saying that right, y'all tell me, um, brought up this point, but blind copy, what are your golden rules or like your golden etiquette around BCC, when to use it, how to use it, or even if we should be using it at all? There, there are reasons to use BCC and it depends on your field. And so there might be a reason you need to use BCC. What I would say when it comes to BCC on messages is that unless you have explicitly told the person that you're, that you're blind copying them, that you should be prepared for them to accidentally reply all and make it known that you've added them in on the communication. I'm, I'm going to date myself, but you might remember back when there was three-way calling. Uh, when we were growing up, I remember this being a fun thing in middle and high school where you know you might call someone on the phone and then have another person on the line and we're not telling you that that person's on the line and that person's listening and hearing the whole conversation. And then because there was no technology to silence their line, you hear their mom call at them or something happening in their background that then totally tells that you have someone eavesdropping on the conversation. And that's just messy. And that's what I think of when I think of BCC is it's messy. I blind copy myself sometimes on things that I want to just make sure I have a record of, but because it's also in my sent box, there's really no reason to do that unless I need to file it somewhere else. So the only time I blind copy myself on something is if I want to be able to file it in an inbox. But there really are way too many opportunities for BCC to get you into trouble. And so what I would say is if you have to use it, use it sparingly and very cautiously. Yeah. My one thing that I would, I try to use it on, and by the way, I love when people use it on me, is if I introduce you to someone, take me off. Good God. I don't want to see the back and forth. Can you meet Tuesday? No. What about Wednesday? I want, I don't know. The intro. Y'all need to meet on your own time. Like unsubscribe, get me out of here. Like move me to BCC. I don't want to be involved anymore. Absolutely. That is a great time to use it. And I will always say that. So when you're putting someone in BCC, another great practice, because Kim, if someone puts you in BCC and they don't tell the rest of the email thread that that's happened, then if you happen to respond, it looks messy. But so say in the message yeah. that that's what you've done. Kim, I'm moving you to BCC to spare your inbox. Simple, quick line. Thank you so much for the introduction. We'll take it from here, moving you to BCC. There's lots of quick ways that you can say that just so that to save yourself, if the other person responds, then we all know that that person was on the message to begin with, as opposed to it being a surprise. 100%. This is another great example. If you're doing a large distribution list or you're having like 10 people in a meeting, I think Jim was talking about this earlier as well, where he's like, then it's the worst because if somebody replies and just says like, thanks, and then somebody else replies and says, thanks, it's like, you're getting like 15 thanks. And you're like, oh my gosh, why, 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 why are these all coming? Yes. Um, I, I think the same is also true for celebratory messages. It's nice to send a BCC and just an email to the person. So if I'm congratulating you for something, Kim, and I want to, I want the whole team to know about it. I BCC the team and just send the message to you. Congrats, Kim. This is amazing. You did X and we're so proud of you. Then nobody, when they hit reply all, it just goes to you. It might go to me too, depending on the settings but it's not going to the whole distribution list because we get messages, we get our, our inboxes are peppered with the thanks and the congrats emails. And that takes up bandwidth and energy just to sift through it requires mental energy and space. And we wanna be careful to make sure we're not missing things. And so it's just adding to people's stress in unnecessary ways. 
So yes, love that yeah. tip as well. We don't, we don't want that. I'm, I'm curious, something I wanted to ask you, which is not totally related to emails, but then I'm thinking, well, maybe it could be. So last month you had a new LinkedIn learning course come out, which I watched, which was all about holding your team accountable. And when I was thinking about like holding people accountable and check-ins and making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing by when, by when they said, I thought, okay, well, maybe email is a good tool for that. And then I sort of was like, well, at what point does email, I guess, become like micromanagey versus like holding somebody accountable? So I know, I don't know, I was just curious of your thoughts on, can you use email, I guess, in a strategic way to hold people accountable for things? Or is that too cumbersome? No, it's not cumbersome at all. It's helpful when there are accountability is a, a word that people get nervous about. And really, it's about making expectations clear and then holding people to those expectations. And when there is accountability on teams, everyone does a better job. And so thinking about what that line is as it relates to where we are in micromanagement versus accountability. That's the part where things can get a little tricky, but email can be a great way to keep a record of what the expectations are. If you are communicating that you need something done and you have an expectation of when it's done by, you might even give why we're doing this and then pass it off. Let the person who's on the receiving end of the message decide how to get it done. When that when you when you get involved in the how, that can be when it starts to feel micromanagey. And if you're going to if you have an expectation that by the deadline they're going to write you back, put that in the message too so that all the expectations are clear. It's really hard to receive an email and wonder, am I supposed to give this person an update? now? Should I send an update in a week? Should I send regular updates on the progress or do I wait until I'm finished and then give them an update? So if you as the person who is doing the delegation can say up front, here's what I need, here's how I would like you to update me, then you're making it easier for the person on the receiving end to then do what you want. Help me help you. I love this idea of kind of help me help you. And I also like Farid's question around attachments versus links. I mean, obviously you've, you've seen a lot of different teams and kind of how they manage. Is there a best practice when it comes to this? I also know that some corporate, at least I'll speak for my clients, um, attachments get a little funky because they can be caught in spam. And then I send the proposal, but my other emails are going through. But since the proposal has an attachment that doesn't go through. I mean, when it comes to kind of helping people help you and making sure your emails get answered. Have you found a best practice for this? It depends on what you're attaching or what you're linking to, but thinking about mm -hmm. what's the easiest way for the person to get the information that they need. And then also based on that, what they're going to do with it, can you make it easier for them to use it? A lot mm -hmm. of times people send attachments and they don't put any details in the 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 file name which makes it then when uh, i download the file i've got to look for it or find it there's no way for me to search for it so when you think about who you're sending something to what they're going to do with the message can you make it easier for them if you include a link is it a link that i can easily access a lot of of companies have firewalls or or SharePoint sites where you send the leak internally, but for someone who's working with you externally, they can't access it or they have to go to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to access it when you could easily screenshot it and send it to me in the body of the message. So the question is, are you attaching the content because it's easier and faster for you or are you doing it because it's the best way for your audience? And if you always think of audience as the, the royalty you are trying to serve in your communication, then you win. Then you win every time. It's about making life easier for the receiver, That's not it. for you. That's it. A thousand percent. Okay. When it comes to making life easier, I know you mentioned Hemingway, you mentioned Grammarly. Are there any apps or programs that you use a lot that you're like, oh, these just make my life so much easier? 
When it comes to email, I don't use a lot of apps because I have a lot of messaging that I do that is confidential for a mm. number of different reasons. And so sometimes the privacy setting on those things is not something that would work with X or Y client or company and you know, working with students, there's protections on, uh, for, for that population as well. So I'm careful about those kinds of things generally. But I do find that the I like to use Gmail because it does things like flag for you when a message that you've sent hasn't been responded to. So it'll say, you sent this message five days ago, no response. Do you want to nudge that person or send a follow up? It also has a plugin that I recommend to, to people called Just Not Sorry. And this is another free, great price uh, plugin that you can add to your, your Gmail account. And this was developed by some faculty and researchers who are looking at the ways that language can, your, your word choice can weaken your message. And this is something that women in particular sometimes do, people who are junior in organizations might say things like, sorry to bother you, or could you just, and you're using words that hedge or that decrease the emphasis of what you're trying to say. And when you do that, you you cut into your own credibility, which is not something that serves you. And so this particular plugin flags that weak language for you and tells you why it communicates a message that might be different than what you were trying to send. Mm, I love that. I feel like I had heard of something like this a couple of years ago, but then maybe it like got out of my Chrome, but it sounds like I need to go back to this thing because I loved it. It was so helpful. Um, I love this question from Jeff. What are your thoughts about email templates? When you say templates, do you mean sort of a form email where you kind of plug in details or what do you mean by template? My guess is yes. Something where if it's an email that you're sending a lot, like maybe it's an intro email or maybe it's like a pitch email if you're doing sales and it's sort of a, a canned email, if you will, where you're changing a few details in each one. Love a template. It can make you more efficient. The big challenge is to make it not feel templatey. So even yeah. if you're using a template, can you make little tweaks to the message before you hit send so that I don't feel like I'm getting the exact same email that you sent to, Ken, to Kim and to Ken and to Josh and to Mahir yeah. and to everyone else? If I think that this is, if I don't think you took the time to communicate just with me, then I think, oh, there's other people who will answer you. But if I think, yeah. oh, this was actually tailored for me, then I think you really want to connect with me. And based on that, that this is an ask that's important to you. And that increases the likelihood that it's important to me too. I love that. So just find little ways within the email that you can really make it personal. Absolutely. And then if you're using a template, a, a, a big mistake that people often make is not remembering to update all the fields of the template. And so you yeah. send something and it has something that's very clearly for Kim and then something that was for the last person or for a different client. You have the wrong company name or you've misspelled it. And all of those are little things that send such it's just so off putting. We yeah. all know that we receive form messages, but if you're getting a form message, you don't feel the need to respond to it. And so if you want people to respond or act on your messages, you need to make it feel like it was meant for them, not that you're blitzing it to everyone. Also, one thing I will just shout out in case anybody else has found this, but when you do use an email template and then you're adding some personal things, make sure everything is the same in terms of font and size. I've definitely seen people that have templates and I can see where, I mean, God love them. I can see where they can add in things about me like, oh, Boston's been well, but then, but then that was in a different, like a grayer font than the rest of it was black. And I was like, oh, I used a template, but like. You tried. So make sure that it also looks looks all the same. Absolutely. And it, even if you can't see it, then highlight all the text and make sure it's the same color because that's another little one where the font all looks the same, but 
when I'm changing the names, the name is blue and everything else. And that just stands out. And I'm thinking, well, all right, if you've asked, if you're sending this email to so many people, I don't have to say yes, because someone else will. Right. Someone, someone else is eventually going to answer you. If I just wait, if I just wait long enough. Um, when it comes to someone else, I'm curious, who are some business leaders or accounts or brands that you follow when it comes to either listening to their podcasts or subscribing to their newsletters or just consuming their content on different social media channels that you're like, oh, I'm really learning from this person. Well, you're one of those people. So I love tuning in to Coffee with Kim. I You always have interesting people and there's so much to learn uh, from your content. I appreciate that. I'm also a fan of uh, Harvard Business Review's Women at Work podcast. I love uh, listening to both of the Amy's talk about issues that come up in the workplace. So those are two of, of the ones that I have tuned into just this week. Oh, I love that. I love when you can really get like good podcast recommendations from people or like good newsletter recommendations because there's always so many gems out there that you're like, oh, I haven't heard of that one or oh, there's a really good episode from this one. Um, I find a lot of times that that I joke that that's like my love language is sharing like episodes and I'm like, oh, I heard this episode and like reminded me of you or I thought of you or I feel like I should share this with you. I feel like if you're sharing content, ah. Oh, that's when it really like gets you right in the heart. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So we love homework around these parts. It's like kind of our favorite thing. So if you could give us all a homework assignment for the rest of this week, it could be to listen to something, could be to watch something, could be to try something. What is a homework assignment that you would give all of us? My, well, so if you want to follow up a deeper dive in the content, there is a LinkedIn learning course that I have on this topic. And there's a lot more that we didn't discuss that you can watch as follow up homework. But I want you to actually try to apply something from this discussion. So you are going to send another email within the next 24 hours. I think that's probably true for everyone that's here yeah. with us right now. So my homework to you is before you hit send, ask yourself some some questions who is who is the person i'm communicating with why am i sending this email do i need to send this email what does this person need i might be needing something from them what do they need in order to make a decision if you're asking them to approve something do they need all the details or do they need just the pieces that, that are important to making the decision? It's easiest for us to make a data dump in an email, but it's actually a lot more work to think about the reader, think about the recipient of our message, put ourselves in their shoes and tailor the message to them. So my homework to you would be within the next 24 hours to attempt something like this. Instead of firing off that email, take some time to think about your audience, why you're sending the message, give them a sassy headline, make the, the headline have standalone sense so that they can tell where you're headed just from the headline. And then if you need them, if there's some action you need of them, put that at the top of the email in a bluff statement, set it up so that it's really a tailored message to them. Uh, email is it, email can be a gift. It can also be a curse because it's so easy and anyone can do it. And we see so much of it being used poorly. So take the time to polish your emails and you're likely going to save yourself time on the back end. A thousand percent. And I would add one more point to that, which is keep in mind that your email reputation matters. And the better emails you send, the cleaner emails, the crisper emails, the easy to answer emails, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then more people will open your emails and more people will answer your emails. So it's sort of like if you, it's like a puppy. You don't want to be the good puppy. You don't want to be the puppy that's like peeing on the carpet. And the more you become the puppy that's peeing on the carpet, the more I'm like, I'm not dog sitting because your puppy's peeing on the carpet. So be the good puppy, be the puppy that people want to play with and answer emails and respond to quickly. You don't want to be the pee puppy. Nobody wants that. I don't want that. Daisy doesn't want that. We don't want that for you. No, thank you. Um, we want better for you. 
We want better for you. Um, Daisy, if people want to keep, I mean, obviously you have a ton of content around accountability, around leading teams, around um, inclusivity, professionalism, email etiquette. Where can people keep learning from you, all of these different subject areas, and just where, where do you spend the most time? The easiest place to find me is LinkedIn. I am okay. responsive. I might be slow to respond, but I am responsive to messages in my LinkedIn inbox and also happy to follow up with learners. I love connecting with people that I can meet on this platform. And so it's been I'm, it's been an amazing experience for me to be a LinkedIn learning instructor. And it's a way that I can share content and information beyond the classroom at the institutions where I teach. So that those are two quick places, connected places to easily find me. Uh, I love this. And I love Rachel's comment, which is, can we have a part two? I agree. We might need a part two because there was so much to cover and I feel like time has flown by. So Daisy, thank you so much for imparting your time and your wisdom and just helping all of us with this. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I It's been so fun watching your conversations all this time. When when I was invited, I couldn't, I was, I was so uh, honored. So thank you for having me. Oh, yay. And thank you guys for joining Daisy and I and for leaning in and asking such good questions and sharing your tips and tricks. I know we both so appreciate you being here. You got a lot of places to be. So joining us just means all that and so much more to us. So really appreciate it. I know you got a busy week coming up. So we will see you here next Wednesday, same time, same place, 1 p.m. Eastern. If you are listening on your favorite podcast app, we love you too. Hopefully you can join one of these lives, but if you can't and you're catching up, just know you can always message me or Daisy on LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever your favorite social media network is. So have a beautiful rest of the week, guys, and we will see you next Wednesday. Bye.